can move about the hill in Washington and deal with issues of major importance, we always look for those who have a philosophy that would be compatible to ours and who understand agriculture issues. And as we sit and discuss the issues uh, in an effort to persuade them to uh, support the things that we feel strongly about, it gives us a great deal of pleasure to uh, list Senator Bob Dole among those who understands the farm issues from the state of Kansas, uh, understanding uh, the problems that are in agriculture. And I just want to give you just a little background on the senator. He served as a captain in the U.S. Army during World War II, received the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. He was first elected to the Kansas State Senate in 1950. He served as a Russell County prosecuting attorney from 1953 to 1960. He served in the U.S. House of Representatives in 1960, the U.S. Senate in 1968. He's a key member of the Senate Ag Committee. He's the ranking Republican senator on the Finance Committee. And without a doubt, he's one of the friends of this organization. He is a prominent candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. And we're proud to have the senator here with us tonight as the farm spokesman for his party. Senator Dole. Thank you very much. Let me say, first of all, that I am pleased to be here. I left the Senate floor this morning about 11 o'clock, and uh, we're working on the largest tax bill in the history of this country. It's called the Windfall Profits Tax. We're talking about $500 billion in the next 10 years, and that's a conservative estimate. And as I look at all the revenue we're going to take from the windfall profits tax, I think we have a right to ask, uh, how will the money be spent? Will any of it go to transportation in rural America? Will any of it go to save the family farm in rural America? And I would say to this group, Republicans or Democrats or Independents, or maybe some just came to the wrong meeting. <laughs> that happens. As I said at the press conference a few moments ago, when I was asked about agriculture and its importance, I'm reminded of what a farmer from Kansas told me about three years ago when times were even tougher. He said, Bob, if you don't eat, don't worry about my problem. And it was about lunchtime, as I recall, and I, I listened very carefully to him. And I just suggest to all those who may not be here tonight, to all those who live in urban America, if they don't eat, they shouldn't worry about your problems. But they do eat. And I think they do worry about your problems. But I can say very honestly, I've had it suggested, maybe only in jest, but sometimes jest turns into something else. And I've had some of my city brethren say, well, if we're going to tax the oil companies, and they should be taxed, and there will be a tax, what about the profits the cattle producers make in this country? And I said, well, I don't know about a windfall profit. I can tell you about a windfall loss as far as the state of Kansas is concerned, and the fact they've lost money seven out of the past 11 years. So I just say this. I know there are a number of people in this audience uh, who are proud to be farmers. I hope everyone in this audience is proud to be a farmer. But I think you better watch very carefully what Congress does and what the President does. I don't care whether he's a Democrat or Republican. We need someone there who understands the American farmer and someone who will stand up for the American farmer 
and not just stand up but say something for the American farmer. I don't care whether that person's a Republican or a Democrat. Now, we have a choice in America. As certainly every man in the Board of Directors knows, we have a choice. We can either preserve the family farm or turn it over to some big corporation. And I would suggest that the American people understood the problem and want to keep the family farm. You can talk about the economies of scale and how cheap food's going to be cheaper if we do this and we do that. We've had some in Congress, and I just discussed this at a press conference. I think you're familiar with the term carryover basis. You know, sooner or later, there's, they say there's two things that are going to happen, taxes and death. And sometime those in this audience will pass on. And if you've worked all your life and saved your property and saved your money and have a farm, it's probably going to get you into some estate tax bracket. Doesn't have to be very big. Now, that's bad enough in itself. But in 1976, without any hearings, the Congress put in a little conference report, something we call carryover basis, which says, in addition to the estate tax, we're going to make you pay a capital gains tax if any of that property is sold by the survivors after you've gone. Now, some have said that's a ripoff for the rich. I'm just suggesting that really impacts most directly on the family farmer and on a small businessman or woman. And we ought to repeal carryover basis, and we're going to repeal carryover basis. We tacked it on the windfall profits tax because we knew President Carter would sign the windfall profits tax. And the vote in the Senate to repeal carryover basis was 81 to 4. And so I suggest this. There is a future in American agriculture. I notice some in the administration, and I'm not here to criticize the administration, are traveling in the country saying good times have returned to the American farmer. Prices are higher than ever before. But so are costs and so are interests. In fact, prices aren't higher than ever before. I've worked in the Senate Ag Committee, and I stood in this same area about four years ago after listening to Senator McGovern and Senator Humphrey. I think there was one other Democratic senator, and I said I felt someone like a skunk at a lawn party, one Republican. <laughs> they had to have a token Republican. They said, well, we'll get Bob Dole to come out. But I said then and I said now, and I've worked together with Senator McGovern and worked with Senator Humphrey, that we have an obligation. I think it never is what party we're in. We have an obligation. If people send us to the Senate, whether they're for us or not, if we go to the Senate or the Congress or wherever we go, we have an obligation to represent our constituents. And as I understand the American farmer and the Kansas farmer, they want to make a profit. They want to make a living. They want to pay their taxes. They want to pay their bills. They want to send their children to school. And I don't quarrel with that. I encourage that. And I say to those who may be trying to make the farmer scapegoat, about once a month you turn on your television and say, oh, the cost of living is going up, and the American food basket is the cause of it. And I don't say it's intentional, but somehow that's an indirect criticism of the American farmer. Somebody is under the misimpression that all the money is going to the farmer. But let me tell you about two or three things. When foreign farm owners were put in a favorable position, as far as American taxes were concerned, we stood up and argued for a foreign investment tax which will abolish any privileges given to overseas investors who threaten American ownership of American farmland. And we won that fight. It was a fight waged by Democrats and Republicans in the Congress. When in the past critics of the food stamp program demanded its elimination or drastic reduction, 
we pointed out that the problem was not with the food stamps per se, but with a relative handful of people who abused the program. So I introduced with Senator McGovern legislation to reform the program without in any way depriving those with a legitimate need from having it met. And in doing so, we retained a program that provides a massive and constant demand for the agricultural products of America's heartland. We won that fight. We won that fight and others because we had two critical elements on our side. One was justice. We were right in our cause, and the other, much more vocal than justice, was you, the men and women whose lives depend upon a sympathetic federal government. Now, new fights lie ahead. And I would say, particularly the Iowa group, since you're going to be bombarded first with all the candidates and have been for months. Nearly every candidate who comes to Iowa says, I'm an expert on agriculture. I'm against inflation. I haven't found a single candidate who's for inflation. Everybody's for a balanced budget. I haven't found a single candidate who's not for a balanced budget and less regulation. But I say to those other candidates, and I say it to myself as well, you ought to be requiring that we debate agriculture in this hall or any other hall in America, all the candidates, whether it's Carter or Kennedy or Brown or Dole or Baker or Reagan, whoever. And then you ought to make a judgment. You ought to toss away your party label for a minute and decide which one of these men, so far they're only men, which one of these men understands my problem, and better yet, which one would do something about it if he were elected? Because I think the thing that disappoints voters the most or Americans the most is to have somebody stand up and promise and promise and promise and never deliver. And if you can't deliver, you shouldn't stand up in the first place. And I don't suggest that means going along with the NFO every time. But I suggest this. It means having a basic understanding of the importance of agriculture. Now, I come from a small town in Kansas. I'm not a farmer. My grandfather was a farmer, both grandfathers in the Depression. They lost everything they had and ended up on welfare. My father ran a cream station. Didn't own it, he ran a cream station. He operated an elevator. He wore his overalls to work every day for 30 years and was proud of it, as you ought to be proud of it. And I just believe that we have a lot of imperfections in our country. And I just believe there are a lot of imperfection in those of us who stand before you and say, follow me or follow that or follow that. And that you ought to demand in advance before you attend the caucus in Iowa or somewhere else or in Minnesota. What does this man know about my problem and what has he done about it? Don't tell me, don't give me your speeches, don't give me your rhetoric, don't give me your handouts, don't give me your TV commercials, give me your record. And I'm willing to stand up here and debate any presidential candidate in my party blindfolded. I'll be blindfolded. They can have notes and farm advisors or anything else. Because I've been there for 19 years, eight years in the House and 11 years in the Senate, I think, fighting for the American farmer. And I believe my record demonstrates that I'm concerned about the American farmer. And I know farmers are very independent. And I know some farmers maybe even disagree in this hall on the agenda for 1980. We have to get the full Congress to adopt the Meat Import Act. We approved it this week, and the Senate Finance Committee it ought to be adopted before Christmas. We have to step up efforts to improve the nutritional awareness of all Americans. We have to get excessive federal regulation off the backs of the American farmer. And all this didn't start with Jimmy Carter. I remember in 1976, there was a little booklet published in the Ford administration called Safety Around Beef Cattle. It turned out to be a bestseller. The first page said, your, said keep your eye on the ground unless your foot might engage some slippery substance and you will fall. And then on it was downhill. 
The second page said, talk softly around your animals, they might jump up and bump you. Now that came as a great revelation to the farmers in my state, and it cost a half million dollars in the process, but that wasn't enough. It was the way it was written. As the farmers had to have a Dick and Jane reader, they didn't understand, you had to have pictures, and they had pictures. And that came as a great surprise to the farmers in my state. So it's very, very serious business. We can all stand up and point up how bad it is under this administration or that administration, but if we don't have anything else better to offer, I don't think we ought to take a look. Let me touch on one other thing. Right now we have 50 Americans who are hostage. Somebody said, well, only 50 Americans. It dominates the news. Radio, television, newspaper, every night you get 10 minutes of Iran and 10 minutes on the hostage, 10 minutes on the students who are marching out in front. But I can tell you, having been in Congress on a daily basis all year long, particularly the last two weeks, the fuse is getting short. And sooner or later, unless they come to their senses in the, government, in the country of Iran, something must be done. And I'm one of those senators and one of those candidates in 76 who went around this country and said, I will never support an embargo if it means lowering farm prices. And I'll not support an embargo for that purpose of food or anything else if it means to lower your prices. But there was an exception then and there is an exception now. We're, for all practical purposes, the hostages are in a state of war with the Iranians. And I don't believe we ought to feed the enemy. And I believe the American farmer is willing on this one selective basis to say to the government of Iran and to try to get our allies to join, we're going to have an economic boycott and we're going to make it stick in this country. And I've been asked, oh, don't say that to farmers. I said, you don't understand farmers. This is not a greedy, graspy group concerned more about profits than lives of Americans, and it never will be. And that's the difference in our country. I want friendly relations with the government of Iran. We've got to have somebody in their senses to talk to, and there's nobody there to talk to. So we have to put on the squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. And we have to support our president. The president speaks with one voice and only one voice. He deserves the support of Republicans and Democrats and farmers and lawyers and doctors and labor union members or whatever. There's plenty of time for fault finding later on. But in this time of crisis, we stand up and support our president. So I just suggest this. I would say this is a very activist group. You've had to fight for what you've gotten from Congress, and sometimes you've failed, but you've had outstanding representation there. And I won't start mentioning names to embarrass anybody. I just say your leadership does an outstanding job. They're respected. They're listened to. They have access and they have influence, and that counts in Washington, D.C. They know the Agriculture Committee. They know the other senators. They know the limits, and that counts in Washington, D.C. And finally, let me say this. Energy is a big problem. There's one provision in the so-called windfall profits tax bill in the House that says that in no event shall the tax exceed 100 percent of net income. Now think about it for a while. You're not in the oil business. 100% of net income is a pretty healthy tax. I think that's going a bit too far, and I'm going to vote for a tax. Oh, we produce oil in Kansas. The average well produces 3.4 barrel a day. You can put it in your pocket. We wish we had more, but it's all we've got. And we produce about 60 million barrels a year. That's enough for about one week's imports. 
But we've got to figure out some way in this country to get the OPEC countries off our back. They're establishing the price. They're setting the policy. And one way to do that is through production, production of known domestic sources, oil and gas, production of alternate sources, gas haul, geothermal, oil shale, solar. We're going to do that through tax credits. And in this so-called windfall profits tax, there's $30 billion set aside over the next 10 years for tax credits. There's $70 billion set aside over the next 10 years for low-income assistance. There's $14 billion set aside for mass transit. There's $1 billion set aside for improving our rail system in the Midwest, which desperately needs it everywhere I go in the Midwest. I also suggest, and I'll be offering the amendment on Friday of this week, I think, that we extend the four cents per gallon gas tax exemption for gas haul until the year 2000, that we increase production of alcohol for fuel on farms and in rural plants, that we develop a rural economic development bank to provide loan guarantees for those and other agricultural initiatives, that we improve our rail transportation system so when you raise a crop you can get it to market and so the farmer doesn't take the loss. And I think that amendment will pass and we also provide tax credits. If you want to install a still for energy purposes on your farm, we'll give you a 20% tax credit. Some will even give you two spigots, but we're going to limit ours to one. But a 20 20% tax credit, and then if you use the alcohol on your farm, you're going to get a tax credit of 40 cents a gallon if it's 165 to 190 proof, or 30 cents per gallon if it's less. And so I suggest that Congress is being responsive to the tax system. And finally, let me say this. I think we have to provide increased support for farm exports. You know, we passed the Export Stimulation Act of 78, and two of those provisions were very important. One said we're going to increase the number of offices across the country. We've done that around the world. We've had five more offices. We upgraded the attaches to counselors, the ag attaches to counselors in all of our foreign embassies. We also provided for the first time we would extend intermediate credit to exporters who in turn could sell the product on deferred payments. But the regulations haven't even been written on that law that was passed by the USDA. We also for the first time said we're going to extend credit to the People's Republic of China in an effort to sell more farm products and raise domestic prices. But I'm sorry to say the USDA hasn't even written the regulations on that provision. We went through the battle last week in the Senate Agriculture Committee on target prices. I sat there, Senator McGovern sat there, and other senators sat there and talked about what they ought to be. And we were told by Howard Yord, and I respect Howard Yord, he's with the administration, that if we do this, it's going to mean a veto of the bill. Oh, some would say, go ahead and veto it. Let them veto it, but you can't eat vetoes. And so the best we could get, we finally raised the target price for wheat with my amendment from $3.50 to three sixty-three, and Howard York said that might invite a veto. And I understand the concerns the NFO have with the loan and resale. We hope we can correct that when it comes to the Senate floor, hopefully next week. It just seems to me that uh, you have a lot of friends. And I know you're frustrated. How many here have been to Washington? Well, I know you're frustrated. <laughs> Others probably prayed to hold their hand. I'm not taking your names. I don't do anything like that. But people come to Washington, they, they tramp the halls of Congress, they walk and walk and walk, wanting to see their member of Congress or see somebody on the staff as you have a right to do. And I would say, in closing, this is what you ought to be doing. The best way to get somebody's attention is a personal visit. The next best way is with a phone call. The next best way is with a letter. 
The worst way is with some petition everybody in the country signs. But I believe Congress is responsive. I believe the climate is better for agriculture in Congress than it's been for 20 years, and I've been there for 19. And I believe if we work together, we can bring about a healthier agriculture, not just for the sake of the farmer, but for the sake of the American consumer. And I believe in the final analysis, you are going to make the judgment when it comes to 1980. It's been said I don't belong to any organized group. I'm a Republican. Well, we're working on that. And I remember in 1976 in this very city when President Ford called me that morning, I said yes before I identified myself, thinking he probably had the wrong number. Then I rushed over to his hotel, the Crown Center. We shook hands and talked a bit, and then we talked about a campaign strategy. I often wondered later on why we didn't use it, but we, we talked about a campaign strategy. <laughs> and we left Kansas City 31 points behind. Chuck Frazier told me about Zelda, the famous fortune teller in Washington, D.C. So when I got back there, I went down to see Zelda, who could look into the future. I said, is it true that you could look into the future? She said, yes. She said, for $500, I will answer any two questions. And I said, $500? Isn't that a lot of money? He said, yes. Now, what's the second question? I said, will I be elected vice president of the United States? He said, yes, you will be elected vice president of the United States. And I said, thank you, Zelda. And she said, thank you, Fritz. <laughs> and so we left there. When it was all over, President Ford had carried 27 states. It was so close that I even thought up to the day of the inaugural that something might turn it around. So I kept my suit pressed and my shoes shine, ready to go at a moment's notice. But I can tell you now, I sort of felt it slipping away that morning when they escorted me out into the cold and Senator Mondale into the heated area, I figured it was probably all over. And a few moments later, I saw them escorting Billy Carter to his seat. And when I noticed that military aid was carrying a six-pack, I knew it was all over. <laughs> but if you're a Republican, sometimes you've got to be an optimist. And I remember precisely at 20 minutes of 12 that day, I turned to Senator Strom Thurmond who in addition to being the father of the century is the ranking Republican on armed services. And I said, Strom, there's still time for a military takeover. Well, you all know what happened. They didn't fire the cannons till after the oath was taken. They're pointing in the wrong direction anyway, so, so it wouldn't have made any difference. But the point is, we settled that dispute at the ballot box in the greatest country on the face of the earth. And we have our differences. Some are proud to be Republicans, some are proud to be Democrats, some are proud to be independents, some don't like any of us. But it's not a popularity contest. We've got to have leadership in America. We've got to have somebody stand up and say, I understand your problem, and I'll do something about it. And I know when speakers finish, you always wonder, how did he get there, or how did she get there? I'll tell you. When I first went to Congress in 60, 1961, they used to find safe areas to send me. They found a safe area in Indiana. I went out for a fundraiser. I got there on a Saturday night. The advance ticket sale, the chairman told me, had already reached 10. He was about ready to collapse at the airport, so they rushed me out to the radio station trying to figure out some way to hype the ticket sales. They first said they were going to cut the tickets from $3 to $1. We're going to have a drawing of a color television set. We're not going to draw till Congressman Doyle, I think they said, gets through talking. Then they started through my war record and my biography. I was born in Kansas, reared in Kansas, all those things you have to do to be, get into politics. Wounded in World War II and all the way down. We got back into the car and headed for town, for Rensselaer, Indiana. And the announcer was summarizing my visit. He said, Congressman Bob Doyle will speak tonight. The ticket's been reduced to $1. It's going to be at the Legion Hall. We're going to have a drawing of a color TV set. Prior to World War II, he was a pre-medical student. He suffered a serious head injury in the war and then went into politics. <laughs> so I don't know how you get into politics in Idaho. We're 25 below zero. Someone just told me a few moments ago or how you get into agriculture, but well, I'll just promise you this. 
Oh, I'm one of the candidates for the nomination for the presidency. I think I'm qualified, well qualified. I think I understand the American people. I'm not a person of wealth. One of the exceptions, I might add, on the Republican side running this year. I grew up in a small town. I suffered some adversity in World War II. It made me a stronger person. Because every day I get up, I understand as I get dressed a little slowly, more slowly than some, that somebody out there may be having a problem. And it may be a Republican or a Democrat or a black American or a white American or a young American or an old American. And I've got a responsibility to those people as well as the others. And if I believe in my party, I've got to believe the only reason for the existence of my party or the Democratic Party is to address your problems. If we're not solving your problems, there's no reason for our existence. And I just say to this audience, you can change America, you can change the world. You can change the Congress, you can change the politics, you can change the executive branch if we work together. And I appreciate more than you know the opportunity to stand here and talk to you for 24 minutes right now. I'm not perfect. I'm not certain there is a perfect candidate running this year. I've checked them all over, not quite. But take a look at our records. Don't look at our speeches. Take a look at our records. I voted some 10,000 times in 19 years. You don't have to guess how Bob Dole votes on farm programs. You get out the record. And the record is there. You don't have to guess how I vote on the economy or foreign policy or education or food stamps or health care. It's one thing to stand up and criticize Senator Kennedy or President Carter on health care. That doesn't solve anything. I've got to have a program of my own, and I do have. We have to address catastrophic illness. We have about 7 to 11 million American families without coverage, and we have to address that problem. So you can do it. You can make the difference. Farmers are important. Consumers understand that farmers are important. We've had a cheap food and a cheap fuel policy far too long in America. Now, the cheap fuel policy has gone over the dam, but there's still a cheap food policy in this country. We still have the best food bargain on the face of the earth. We still spend only about 17% of our disposable income on food. We're down about 4 to 5% who feed everybody else in this country. And it's time they understood the American farmer had something to offer other than taxes and work and sweat for everyone else. So whatever happens, remember when it comes to farm policy, it's not always Republican or Democratic, and it shouldn't always be Republican or Democratic. It ought to be for the interest of America and the American farmer. And I'm going to stick with the American farmer. Thank you very much. in May of this year and will serve a term until 1983. Dr. Stone is a Democrat and served from 1975 to 1979 as Commissioner of Insurance for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He was born and raised in New York, received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard with highest honors in economics. In 1969, he earned his PhD in economics at Harvard. He was a lecturer on economics at that same university faculty, and from 1973 until his appointment, served as commissioner of insurance. He has authored numerous books and publications on economics and finance. In visiting with Dr. Stone just a few moments ago, I wanted to make sure that I understood exactly what his assignment and role was as appointed by the President. 
We know that we have the Chicago Board of Trade, the Mercantile, and other futures trading boards. And Dr. Stone's assignment is to take and police the action of those people who participate in that paper exchange commodity. And without a doubt, he recognizes the improprieties in that system. He has the responsibility to supervise that program. And I want to assure him that we do not believe that farm markets ought to originate on the Board of Trade, that those markets are to originate at the farm level. And so his assignment to be the police force, the task force that supervises the Board of Trade in their effort to cause market gyration, and they survive with buying cheap and selling high. And he recognizes the need for that agency. And so I introduce to you Dr. Stone as appointed commissioner and chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Dr. Stone. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a great privilege to be granted the chance to speak at this annual convention of the National Farmers Organization. Producers of commodities are without question among the most important constituents of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Yet the relationship between farmers and the agency of which I'm chairman has been surprisingly distant. I'd like to use this opportunity to invite a change in that situation. My remarks on the subject will be very brief. Altogether, too many citizens whose livelihoods are affected by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission's work have scant knowledge of what we do. Let me begin with a very short summary of our mission and our history. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission is the watchdog agency for the futures business. We are a relatively new agency, only five years old. We succeed, though, a much older agency, the Commodity Exchange Authority, which was a part of the United States Department of Agriculture. Our predecessor body was created in 1922, largely in response to farmer distrust of hitherto unregulated markets and grain futures. Unfortunately, the Commodity Exchange Authority was given too small a staff and too limited a set of powers to provide the assurances of market honesty it was established to guarantee. If the regulators perceived an ongoing futures manipulation on one of the exchanges, there was little that could be done except threaten the would-be manipulators with an administrative action because the agency had no injunction authority, no real clout, and by the time the administrative case ever reached a judge, the damage was likely to have already been done. When cases did reach the courts, the opposition, often the boards of trades themselves, were represented by the nation's leading specialists in commodities law. Despite the best of intentions, the Commodity Exchange Authority, all too seldom, won applause as a fierce protector of the public interest in commodities. In 1974, however, the Congress recognized the mismatch between the regulator and the regulatee, and it decided to strengthen the watchdog over the commodity exchanges. It created the Commodity Futures Trading Commission as an independent five-member commission, authorizing a larger staff and giving the agency broader powers. The commission was given very strong emergency powers over futures markets, and the right to go directly into court without Justice Department approval in the event of a threatened manipulation of prices. The regulatory scope of the agency was extended beyond just the agricultural commodities that had been in USDA to include what we have now, which encompasses gold, silver, metal trading, currencies, treasury bills, and a whole variety of financial instruments. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission has three basic constituencies. 
farmers and other producers of commodities, commission house customers holding futures positions, and the users of regulated commodities. Our track record, frankly, in the protection of these constituencies since our inception has been, in my view, mixed. On the positive side, the agency has significantly toughened the industry's standards of fair play. The Commission has promulgated meaningful criteria for contract designation. No new futures contract can be traded until it's approved by the Commission. And no new contract is entitled to that approval until we've been assured that it provides a broad deliverable supply and a demonstrable economic purpose. We've increased the number of delivery points in some of the existing contracts, such as soybeans and corn. We've demanded and received improvements in exchange rules for floor practice, and we brought enforcement actions where the rules were not followed, as in cases involving soybean future trading on the Chicago Board of Trade, the 1974 period. We've instituted licensing standards and interagency background checks for the retailers at registered futures commission merchants. And to better ensure market integrity, we've mandated a large trader reporting system and we maintain a computerized surveillance system allowing day-by-day -day coverage of regulated markets. Enforcement actions have been brought against would-be manipulators, such as cases arising from the main potato default of 1976 and resulting in the imposition of substantial fines and the revocation of the alleged manipulator's trading privileges. Recently, the Commission established its right to go even farther and actually close a market, in this case the wheat market in March in Chicago, when it was shown that a small band of floor traders held a potentially manipulative position roughly three times the known deliverable supply. All of these steps represent valuable contributions to the protection of customers, users, and producers. There's one area, however, worthy of discussion today in which I feel the agency's performance can and should be improved. There has been altogether too little producer constituency participation in the CFTC's regulatory process. Farmers have failed to make their voices heard at the CFTC, and they've seldom been encouraged by the agency to do so. We hear with great regularity from the exchanges, from industry groups representing the exchanges and the Futures Commission merchants. Commercial users of commodities devote plenty of time and energy to keeping the Commission informed of their interests and concerns. Commodity customers, trading customers to some extent, are able to express themselves through our reparations process for the settlement of grievances. It's the producers we hear from least, and that doesn't make sense. Your needs and ours would be well served by remedying this void in representation. It's ironic, I think, that the lack of producer participation, farmer participation, has come to exist. My view of regulation is that government intervention is justified in a market when the power of buyers and sellers is unfairly matched. If one side of a market is well organized, concentrated, and powerful, while the other side is weak, dispersed, and less than fully informed, the strong side of the market may well take undue advantage of the weak side. Government, through the regulatory process, would then have a duty to intervene and right that balance. It does not take an extensive agricultural experience, and as you heard, I'm a New Yorker, I'm not a farmer, but it does not take extensive agricultural experience to see that American family farmers are not well organized and can be disadvantaged in exactly the manner I've described. This group, the NFO, of course, is committed to the proposition that increased organization by the farm community is the best long-term response. I cannot dispute that. I think that's exactly right. But we all know, however, we all know, however, that that's very difficult. In the meanwhile, maybe the next best answer is to use the available tools of government. It's unfortunate that the best organized elements in the market 
are also the best equipped to make their voices heard in Washington. Those who need our help are those we ought to be listening to. The CFTC and I cannot stand here and say that there is a cure for all the troubles the American farmer that I can offer through the CFTC. We're not an agency with scope that broad. Please turn tape to side two.